Chief Justice, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third lecture of the BIFC Court Lecture Series for 2015. This time organized in cooperation with the Wills and Probate Registry. What an honor to have here Chief Justice Michael Huang and three distinguished members of the legal profession to that um, and a lecture which is being broadcast around the world thanks to the Thomson Reuters and their technology. It is a great pleasure to welcome to the podium Chief Justice Michael Huang to start the ceremony today. We would appreciate if you could turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Thank you for your presence. I hope we will make your participation in this uh, lecture uh, worthwhile and uh, let you go away with some new ideas and possibly leave some of your good ideas behind with us. Um, we have got a very interesting panel on a very interesting subject, uh, which is how the DIFC is contributing to the development of a uh, infrastructure for non-Muslims living in Dubai um, to make wills that comply fully with their testamentary intentions. Um, the WPR, the Wills and Probate Registry, uh, was launched quite recently. Some of you may have been present at, at the launch and some of you may have visited uh, our registry uh, recently. Um, it has gone off um, actually quite exponentially, um, which is not entirely a surprise to us because we actually have budgeted for quite a quick take up uh, of what we are offering, uh, and we were not disappointed. Um, and so we know that there is a lot of interest in this topic out there. And so this is just the first step in introducing uh, those of you who have not yet had the time or opportunity to study the details of the registry and how it works um, in conjunction with the DIFC courts. So that's why this uh, presentation this evening is sponsored both by the DIFC courts as well as the uh, World and Probate Registry, which technically comes under the Dispute Resolution Authority. Um, we have here four distinguished speakers, um, all very expert in this particular field. Um, I will introduce them in turn uh, when they come to speak. Um, and the first speaker uh, is the person who has almost single-handedly been responsible for this project getting off the ground, uh, and that is uh, Mihaila Moldovino, who uh, was originally uh, em em engaged by the DIFC courts, uh, and then when we were able to establish the Wills and Probate Registry uh, as the, uh, as an actual legal entity, uh, Mihaila uh, was the obvious candidate to uh, assign to be the first senior manager uh, of our registry. So uh, for now, uh, she is the person in charge of our Wills and Probate Registry. Um, so she will uh, be able to answer uh, all of your questions directly related to uh, the WPR as well as how the WPR will link up with the DIFC courts. Uh, Mihaila is more commonly known as Ella, and uh, her uh, academic record uh, is in the background of, in the fields of economics, law, and policy. Um, and she was educated uh, at several universities in, the, in Europe and has worked extensively in Europe, both uh, as in management and consultancy positions. Uh, as well as for supranational institutions such as the European Parliament and the United Nations. Um, she's fluent in six European languages, 
and has a great um, number of assignments, um, both in Europe, the US, and in Central Asia. Now, I will now introduce, uh, I will now invite uh, Ella to come and speak to us to explain uh, the basis of the Girls and Probate Registry. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Honorable guests, the deal with one's death isn't only an emotional shock. It can also become a major problem, drawing families apart and entangling them in costly and time-intensive, legally complex processes. Everywhere in the world, this may disturb any semblance of order and normalcy that people try to restore after the passage of a loved one. In the UAE, following the death of a person, the distribution of the assets of the deceased is guided by the UAE federal laws, such as the personal status law and the civil transaction code, and the public order. The rules that we have set up to govern the wills and probate registry complement existing UAE laws on inheritance for eligible citizens with assets in Dubai. We have created this structure under the umbrella of the Dispute Resolution Authority, and we have formally launched it last month. The Dispute Resolution Authority being the third body of the DIFC. As I have um, also quickly um, drafted on the first slide, you will see the Dispute Resolution Authority, the umbrella body, having as its main pillar the DIFC courts, an ancillary body, the DIFC wills and probate registry, and then other ancillary bodies that will be set up under the DRA. I do not want to dwell on this for too long, it's just to give you an idea of what is to come and to have you actually um, interested and uh, attentive to, in the following months and years, to the various bodies that will be set up under the DRA and the structures that will be created. In Dubai, the uncertainty about assets distribution, specifically for non-Muslims and non-citizens, has brought about expats to bring away their um, businesses or their assets and to move them away from Dubai, what is actually called capital flight or um, basically a loss for the uh, UAE economy. Because of this development, the UAE public policy um, decision takers have decided to allow for the creation of a new body, the DFC Wills and Probate Registry, allowing for registration of wills of non-Muslims and allowing for eligible people with assets in Dubai to transfer their assets to their loved ones after death, as they deem fit. The registry has been set up on its legal basis by His Highness Sheikh Maktoum, President of the DIFC, by issuing the Resolution 4 of 2014 and approving the establishment of the DIFC Wills and Probate Registry. It is a first of its kind service and I'm happy to say that it is the first such initiative in the MENA region. There are similar systems across the world. We have systems in Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, where you have separate rules and laws guiding succession for Muslims and non-Muslims. However, for the Middle East and North African region, this is a first such system in place. The DIFC um, is an English-speaking common law jurisdiction. And so the wills that will be registered with the DIFC Wills and Probate Registry also can be written and will be written in the English language and registered in English in accordance to the principles of testamentary freedom. Further on, um, the registry itself is aimed to support the wider development of the UAE. And as we are in 2015, the year of innovation in the UAE, we hope that this legal innovation will also bring about a um, cooperation to encourage capital investment in Dubai and support the economic growth. Here is a picture behind um, which we are proud to show to you today as after a long time of work, we have managed to set up the registry and launch it 
formally on the 4th of May, so that was a month ago. And you will see um, Dr. Abdul Aziz El Horeir, the board member of the DIFC, um, our Chief Justice, Mr. Michael Huang, um, cutting the ribbon for the new office space, Mr. Essa Kazim, the governor of the DIFC, and um, Dr. Ali Ibrahim Al Imam, the head of the Cassation Courts in Dubai, formally um, launching the Wales and Probate Registry and inaugurating the premises. I do not wish to um, bore you for too long with the technicalities of the laws because there will be, there can be so much that we can say about it. And this is why today we came together and we decided amongst each other to divide those particular um, provisions in the rules that we deem are important for you at this stage, namely the construction of wills, how to draft wills, and how our rules are building upon existing UAE laws. And I will swiftly explain at the end uh, part 55 of the rules of the courts, which refer to contentious probate claims, probate um, process being a process of executing and administering the estate of a deceased person. Now, however, I would need to bring about the overall structure and to introduce these rules to you as they have been enacted by the head of the DRA on April 29th. They're pretty recent. Even for the legal community in Dubai, we have had a public consultation period in uh, 2014, back in November. Um, I was very happy to see a lot of the members of the legal community walk through our doors at the courts reviewing the rules, giving us feedback, asking questions. However, I have also seen that there are many more coming through at this stage, and I anticipate there will be many more coming through in the next months. And um, I appreciate the rules are pretty long. I think about 120 pages all in all. So um, for those of you who have not yet um, taken the time to read them, I would advise you to take a very big coffee, sit at Starbucks for at least half a day, and read through the rules. Do not get discouraged. Um, they are set out to incorporate main principles and processes of succession planning based on international best practices from various leading common law jurisdictions, such as the UK, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Australia, and others. Um, very important to note is that new rules reflect the spirit of UAE laws and that they provide non-Muslims the right to choose the way in which their estates are distributed and that they complement existing UAE laws. They do not conflict them. Um, the distinguished panel members will explain to you in more detail what this actually means. I would like to also draw upon the practicalities. Um, as in the first instance, the setup of the registry is so that um, people walk through our doors every day for will registrations. We hope that no one will pass away soon, that we won't have uh, many probate cases initially, but obviously it is the inevitables of life that at some point we all do pass away. So probate will be part of the process, of the initiation process through the Wills and Probate Registry. However, for the past month, um, I'm glad to say we have been fully booked with appointments and we have registered quite a few wills from various people from various nationalities, um, various structures here in Dubai. The process is simple, um, a very straightforward, simple process. A person who wishes to register their will would book an appointment online on our website, dfcprobate.ae, and then they would come with the um, drafted will to the registry, and they will register the will um, in our presence. Noteworthy to say is that both residents and non-residents in the UAE can register a DIFC will as long as they have assets in Dubai and they're eligible to opt into our jurisdiction. This is an additional opt-in mechanism that has been created for Dubai to provide choice for people to decide how to deal with their succession. However, if they wish to benefit from this jurisdiction, from the DIFC court jurisdiction for probate and from the system in place, the formal real registration is required. So is, there is a compulsory aspect to people registering the will during their lifetime if they want their succession to be handled through the DIFC courts in a common law English speaking environment. The registry does not provide legal advice. We are um, a pure administrative body. We register the wills 
And I cannot insist and say this often enough that I advise every person to seek the advice of a licensed um, legal professional to actually get their will drafted and to think about it as if it was a very important legal document. Specifically because it is different from a contract where people would actually look at it and implement it immediately after time of signature. The will is drawn upon and looked by the judge once the person has passed away. So there is no way to clarify what the intentions were or why the specific person did not think to cover certain scenarios in their will. We're happy to announce two major legal innovations that we brought about in our roles that distinguish this, set, this legal basis from many other jurisdictions across the world. The first one is the formal execution or signing of a will at time of registration in the presence of a registry officer and a second witness chosen by the testator. Why did we set it out this way? To reduce the risk of challenges to the validity of the will such as undue execution, forged signature, and so forth. The second legal innovation is that a will will be taken and stored in its electronic format at a registry as the original for the remainder of the life of the testator. Of course, we shall provide the testator with a certified copy of their will, and they are free to inspect it during their lifetime. However, in order to avoid damage, loss, misplacement, or tampering with the will, as it often happens, we decided to become the custodian of the will. However, people are free to modify the will as often as they want during their lifetime. And after death, confidentiality is important for us. The parties to the will, so people who have been named in the will, whether they are beneficiaries, guardians, or executors, can come and inspect the content of the will but no third party can come and access the will. The probate process um, is initiated with the wills and probate registry. The appointed executor can come in and <coughs> present a um, death certificate of the testator, of the deceased, they identify themselves, fill out a form, and then initiate the probate process the formal request for a grant of probate. Then the registry, um, as soon as it is, um, it, it actually checks through the administrative requirements, will then send the case over to the DIC courts, and then the judge at the court will actually um, look at the will and decide to issue the grant of probate. The grants will be issued in the name of the DIFC courts, will have the seal of the DIFC courts, and will, and will be signed by a judge or a court officer acting with the authority of the courts. Thereafter, the executor can enforce the grants in Dubai and the orders, the guardianship orders as well, um, with various UAE authorities and agencies. Another novelty for the DIFC courts is that all such grants and orders will be issued in both English and Arabic, allowing for a seamless, easy um, <coughs> enforcement to occur with the various government departments, which have um, a, a majority of their staff English speakers, sorry, Arabic speakers. Obviously, there is an element of judicial discretion in inheritance. The will is only validated once a person passes away, and the formal validation of a will happens through the judge issuing a grant of probate. Um, I've made in this slide a short reference to the Dubai Law 12 of 2014, namely Article 5, which mentions and talks about the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. Um, noteworthy for you would be that the Court of First Instance at the DIFC shall have the exclusive jurisdiction over any application or case of which the courts have jurisdiction to consider under the center's laws and regulations, and that the governing law is the law of the DIFC. Um, and so in the will, when people draft the will, they also subject the will to the DIFC laws and to the rules, the wills and probate registry rules. 
there is a structure in the rules. The main part, the main document you will find on our website, on the top of the page rules, which form the main bulk of the rules, about 72 pages. Then part 55, the second aspect of the rules is the rules of the DIFC courts, which deals with contentious probate matters. And then you have various forms, such as witness statements and probate application forms, templates um, of grants of probate and guardianship orders, and information about the registry fees. I will talk about part 55 at the end of the lecture. I thank you for your attention. I would like to welcome Chief Justice back to the podium to introduce our next guest speaker, Mrs. Cynthia Trench. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Cynthia Trench. Uh, Cynthia uh, was raised uh, in Hong Kong, uh, but arrived in Dubai uh, in 1989, and she has been living and working here since then. Um, she uh, pr has practiced in many fields, uh, corporate and property law, uh, as well as private client work. Uh, and she was uh, appointed by the Ruler's Office uh, in 1996 as the first female expatriate licensed legal consultant. Um, since 2008, uh, Cynthia has spoken at many seminars on the subject of estate planning in the UAE and tax issues for UK expatriates and on the effect of Sharia law on the assets of expatriates in general. Now, she's given seminars at many different forums, including the HSBC Premier Clients, large corporation space in the UAE, wealth managers, and financial institutions. And most recently, in February of 2011, Cynthia organized a symposium on asset protection and estate planning, which was sponsored by Emirates Airlines and the Chamber of Commerce in Abu Dhabi. Cynthia is actively working with the Dubai Economic Council and the Chamber of Commerce in Dubai and Abu Dhabi to see whether the area of inheritance laws for expatriates can be improved. So I now I hand you over to Cynthia. Thank you, Chief Justice. It's really indeed an honor for me to be here today in front of all of you, your excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, and also to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, yes, I've been here for quite a long time, 26 years, and uh, especially during the last five to ten years, I have been trying my best to find solutions to this area which I find or found to be very confusing until this year. Um, in front of you or under you, depending on where it is, there's a, a little leaflet which is what I've basically handed out showing what I'm going to speak about today. There's only two parts to this leaflet, unlike sometimes some of my handouts. And it outlines the topic that I want to speak about. And they're very short and brief questions. The first and foremost question is, and I'd like to step out here so that you can see me a little bit better. And I am standing, just in case you're wondering. Uh, the first and foremost is, I'm trying to move this as well. Hold on. How do I move it? What is a properly drafted will? I have many, many clients, many, many friends and colleagues at law coming to me, asking me this question constantly. I've had arguments with clients mostly on what is their residence, domicile, or nationality. A lot of people would say, I am domiciled in UAE, not understanding, in fact, this is really the country of residence for most people. Of course, those who've lived here for donkey's years, like myself, would claim, perhaps, that this is their country of domicile. But as Alistair would allude later on, we have to be careful if we claim that, because if you know anything about the EU latest law called Brussels 4, which is going to be introduced or implemented in August 2015, the law of habitual residence, which is here, could very well apply to all your assets in terms of inheritance distribution. So you have to know what you're doing. 
For those people who have fairly clear-cut countries of birth, origin, countries of domicile and residence, that's an easy thing. But a lot of us nowadays would be born in one country, educated in another, went to live somewhere else, and now reside here. We really don't know where we're from. So let's have a look at this little survey, which I hope is useful for you, and I hope that you won't really pour into it this moment, but it's really for you to take home. But it shows immediately the diversity of the type of countries that we're talking about. Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, France, Sweden, Austria, USA, UK, in fact, England and Wales, and, and let us not forget Scotland, very separate place. And in fact, the, Lebanon is so full of different laws concerning inheritance, it demanded its own sheet, which I will not give you today, but you're welcome to ask me later on. But if you look at here, you will see that a will can be in various forms in different countries. It can be in different languages. Please note that in Germany, it should preferably be in German. In Switzerland, it's recommended to use your official Swiss language from the canton where you're from. Did you know that? Should you take advice from a lawyer when you draw up a will? Or should you go to W.H. Smith and get that latest printed form? Of course, us lawyers would say, yes, you have to ask the lawyers. Why is that so, especially these days when you're talking about countries with high taxes? For example, US, France, Italy, UK. If you step in the wrong direction with regard to drafting your will, you could very well have your estate lumbered and your spouse's estate lumbered with multiple inheritance tax issues. And I will come back to witnessing in a minute because it's very interesting to know that in most civil jurisdiction, civil court, uh, law jurisdiction, you have the notary system being in operation. Italian notario, in French notaire. And in the common law jurisdiction, which is UK, Hong Kong, Australia, most parts of America, you would have the witnessing provision, which is normally witnessed by two witnesses. But I'll come back to that in a minute. So what is a properly drafted will? For everyone, that answer could be different, all right? So there's nothing called a pan-international will. Next. Can a properly drafted will from your home country, for example, domicile, country of origin or permanent residence, or nationality, be upheld in the UAE? Now, this is something that a lot of colleagues at law and I have discussed ad nauseum. Let us refer to the laws. Very important to look at the laws in this country. Why is that? Because this is a civil code country. Civil code means that everything should be enacted. Before 1st of May, or should I say 30th of April of this year, there was no DIFC laws with regard to wills until it was actually enacted and issued. So the first law that I would like to remind you about, the one that everyone talks about, the ones who love to talk about home wills, is Article 1-2 of the UAE Personal Status Law. Will writers, lawyers, would love to use this article because it says, you can choose your home law, you don't have to choose UAE law in terms of your testamentary freedom. Okay? That's basically what Article 1-2 of the UAE Personal Status Law says. And if you look at the next law, which is Article 17-1 of the Civil Transactions Code, it seems to also say this. It says that inheritance shall be governed by the law of the deceased at the time of his or her death. So it seems to actually enforce this idea that home wills could be enforced in the UAE. However, here creeps in the conflicting article. <laughs> article 17.5, it says that the laws of UAE 
shall apply to wills made by expatriates disposing of their real estate in the UAE. So this actually follows the common law concept, which is lex loci, whereas they actually, the jurisdiction of common law, believe that wherever your real estate lies, you have to look at that country as to whether you need to make a will there. So for example, if you are one of those lucky persons, and can I please be invited next time, that have a lovely chalet in Switzerland or a wonderful bungalow in France, <laughs> then you should look at perhaps having a separate French will or Swiss, Swiss will done. However, then the next point is very important. Oops, hold on. What people don't understand is that we are only, we are not talking of the laws in print. We must talk about practice and procedure. Those people, colleagues of ours at the back, we've been here for years, as I've already alluded to earlier. We know what it's like practicing here. It's not at all easy because there could be conflicting judicial decisions, this being a civil code jurisdiction. However, for us, there's one certainty. These days, across the UAE in all the Emirates, the courts of inheritance at the courts of first instance are presided by Sharia judges. And the Sharia judges do not want to look at an English will, a Scottish will, I see somebody smiling there, a Chinese or Hong Kong will. They don't want to see that. They want to apply, and they will, and they have done so, applied Sharia. And they utilize Article 2, which I've now highlighted up there, to say that the rules and principles of Islamic jurisprudence shall be relied upon in the understanding, construction, and interpretations of these provisions. They would disregard the earlier courts of cassation cases that we know and love, the 1998 Court of Cassation case, which very clearly upheld the German national's estate and laws and favored the wife, the spouse, to be the sole beneficiary of the estate instead of Sharia heirs, and many other similar superior court decisions. So the Sharia judges, unfortunately, disregard the previous judgments because they are not binding in the civil code jurisdiction, and they utilize Article 2 to explain the reason why. So what do you do if you have a home will that you think is validly drafted? Remember the survey that I've done. You, let's say, come from France, have a properly drafted, notarially drafted French will. And that particular will applies to your worldwide assets, let's say. OK? And unfortunately, you die. So what happens then? Your executors come to the UAE with the French will. The court of Sharia would immediately disregard it and apply Sharia to your inheritance. Your executors need to file an appeal. Now, this is where all these rumors and anomalies have actually arisen. How many of you have heard that a properly drafted will needs to be notarized and attested in your consulate? I think many of you, all right? I don't know how many of these clients of mine who come to my office and sheepishly I don't know why they're in my office in the first place, but they produce this will. They go, hello, you know, I've got this will, and it's really lovely. It's got notarial stamps and legalized stamps. What do you think? And I go, oh, dear. Legalization, notarization, translation doesn't have to happen until you're dead. I know it sounds very abrupt. But your estate only needs to get the documents, grant a probate from the common law jurisdiction, 
or the court order from a civil code jurisdiction to be notarized and legalized at that point in time, as per Article 13 of the UAE Evidence Law. I will tell you a very nice 2014 Court of Appeal decision in Abu Dhabi, which actually used this Article 4, uh, 13 recently, and said, yes, of course, the lady who died and was a UK national, her grant of probate, duly notarized, legalized, and officially translated, can be submitted to the Court of Appeal, and was accepted. So the next very important question is, okay, so one is you can have either a properly drafted home will, but you have to file an appeal. What you don't know is going back to that question is that that could take a very long time. That could take 12, 18, 24 months. I had a workshop at Barclays Bank once and one of the officers stood up and said, I'm sorry to tell you, the rest of you officers, but I actually had to wait for four years before the ruling was made in my favor. So she went through the appeal process. And you can imagine four years of having to go through the appeal process. Do you think it's cheap? It's not. It could range anything from 50 to 100,000 dirhams. So we're talking on the one hand a properly drafted home will, okay? And then we have another breed of wills that arise in the UAE. And we have seen it on the Facebooks. We have seen it in the newspapers. We've even heard people over the news or in various radio shows, they talk about Sharia compliant wills. And I'm very passionate about this topic. And I'm absolutely shocked that there could be people saying that there could be Sharia compliant wills drawn up by those people who do not want to be Sharia compliant. Now, first of all, for those people who know about what is Sharia compliant, how much of your estate can you have to come under a Sharia will? Which is the part of your estate? One third. Everyone knows the one third rule. One third of your net worldwide asset can only be under a Sharia will as a Muslim. The rest is already equitably divided as per the Islamic jurisprudence. Various percentages as dictated as to who is in your immediate bloodline family structure. So if you have a will, and I've seen these wills, remember the people come into my office. They come in, the, the other batch of people come into my office. They go, right, this has got to be fine. I say, why is that? Because it says here that I do not want to comply with the Sharia provisions of the UAE. I said, oh, okay. So that means what? Why would that will be valid? Because under Article 242 of the Personal Status Law, it says very clearly that anything that is written contrary to Islamic intents shall be void. Those provisions shall be void even if the will is valid. Scary, isn't it? It's amazing about subliminal advertising, how many people believe what they hear. And ladies and gentlemen, remember, read the laws. It's very, very clear. Before 30th of April 2015, there were no laws that allowed non-Muslim expatriates to draw up a will in accordance with the laws of UAE. You could draw up a will in accordance with your home country. That's different. Now, Notar notarization, as per the survey, you can study that at your leisure, is required in certain civil code jurisdictions because that's a system that they have in France, in Germany, in various other systems, apparently in Netherlands, and so on and so forth. But 
In some jurisdictions, notarization of a will is absolutely not required for it to be valid. And furthermore, when you take it to the notary public in Dubai courts, most of us do not realize, but usually it means attestation by one person. And what does it mean here? It says that the notary public, it says in the leaflet distributed by the notary public, authentication does not ensure that it would be enforced by any competent court of law. So if you have one person witnessing a common law jurisdiction will, Stephen, for example, English will, how many witnesses? Two witnesses. <laughs> Two witnesses are required for most common law jurisdiction wills. And if there are no two witnesses, what happened to those wills? They are invalid. So you have properly drafted home wills, but they go through the route of appeal. You have locally drawn up so-called Sharia compliant wills that are also wrongly attested, that are void. So what do you think I prefer? As apparently the first woman to have had her will registered in the DIFC. I prefer the DIFC. Why is that? This is a common law jurisdiction. Have I exceeded my time, nearly? This is a common law jurisdiction. What does common law mean? It means a system of stare decisis. The judicial judgments, the judgments are binding on the lower courts. So that means that there will be and there is legal certainty. There's clarity of law. If you want to go and visit the www.difcprobate.ae website, there is the WPR rules there in their entirety that you can download. Makes good bedside reading. And the process is very, very clear. The ease of registration is there. And on top of that, they have absolutely made sure that all the government departments are buying into the DIFC wills registration. They are making memorandum of understanding with each of the government departments, for example, most importantly, the DLD, RTA, and so on and so forth, economics departments and so on. So just to reiterate, before the 1st of May 2015, there are no laws in the UAE which enable a non-Muslim expatriate to draw up his or her will here. The next few pages just basically show the definitions that are important. As I have mentioned earlier, it is, or also Ella has mentioned it, it is a system of rules for non-Muslims. People over the age majority have to be there for being a testator or an executor or guardian. Beneficiary, of course, can be any person. Doesn't have to be English speaking. The testator does not have to be a resident. Very, very important point. It just has one additional limitation. It can only cover Dubai assets. And I'm going to run through this very quickly so that you can read it at your leisure. There's one point that's very important. You can appoint interim and permanent guardians in your wills. And I think Diana is going to talk about it further. The question that a lot of people have asked, how do I put my non-Dubai assets, especially in the other Emirates, to come under my Dubai DIFC will. Very, very easy. Put it under a Jebelali Free Zone offshore company. Your property in other Emirates, your businesses, Sharsha Airport Free Zone, Russell Kema Free Zone, Creative Zone, Fujera, 
And then all your assets will suddenly miraculously come under the DIFC will in one fell swoop. And don't forget, it's all of your present and future assets that you will acquire for both movable and immovable. So it's actually very wide. And there's no distinction between whether it's mortgaged or not mortgaged. Okay? So that's it really for me. Are we having Q&As at the end? Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Diana Hamad, uh, who must be a familiar figure to many of you here. She is a UAE national lawyer with experience in family law before the local courts in the UAE <coughs> for the last eight years. She graduated from the UAE University in Al Ain uh, in Sharia law uh, and later obtained a master's degree from Aberdeen in Scotland. Her experience in Sharia and law has got Diana involved in many initiatives of the Dubai government to address family law issues and matters including succession. She writes and authors articles for newspapers and magazines and appears on TV talk shows presenting the law in the UAE. And she has been chosen as the most influential female lawyer in Dubai uh, by the brief uh, and as the best legal writer by the national. Um, she set up her own firm, which is known as International Advocate Legal Services, uh, after spending eight years with the Dubai Government Legal Service. So over to you, Diana. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you. My name is Diana Hamadi, as per the introduction, which <coughs> the Honorable Michael Wang has given. Um, I'm a UAE national lawyer. I appeared before the courts in the UAE. And um, luckily, I've registered with the IFC courts as well. Um, I have been invited to the panel that wrote, overlooked the rules of um, the wills and probate registry at the DIFC, not at all from my experience in common law wills, of course, as per what you have heard. It was mainly to confirm that the law, the rules which we have now, are in conformity with the UAE law, which I'm deemed to be somehow um, a humble expert on, due to my experience, due to my studies, and due to my knowledge. Um, when I was first invited to the panel, in my mind I was thinking before arriving to the first meeting, what do we do with, this, with these rules? It was kind of the unknown, especially in light of what Ella and Cynthia have said about the situation that we had in the UAE regarding the wills of non-Muslims. There was so much uncertainty that allowed a lot of people to take advantage of that and mislead people into believing that there was something called Sharia compliant wills, which actually surprised most of us as legal experts and legal practitioners, especially for someone like me who would end up at court at the court of first instance Looking at a judge, I, I'm not getting the judge a, a will that was mainly um, written, um, done in an overseas country. I'm giving him a will that was notarized by the notary public in Dubai. And the first thing he would look at me and say, don't bring up that thing again, Diana. No wills for non-Muslims. What well, applies to you applies to them. So I can say now, <laughs> Um, unfortunately to me, unlike Cynthia, I will not be able to do my will at the IFC since I'm not a Muslim, of course. So, so since I'm a Muslim and I'm not a non-Muslim, so I would not be able to do it now, maybe in the future, you never know. For the time being, I'm gonna talk about how did we go about that conformity and how many issues it actually raised while we were debating these rules and this law. Of course, while we were meeting, we were still looking forward to the decree of His Highness Sheikh Maktoum bin Mohammed, which actually was passed as resolution number four, which gave the DIFC 
um, the authority to issue these rules and um, 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 regulate them and manage them and, of course, implement them. Um, the main points that you would imagine, the first thing you would ask yourself, what would a person be able to do with his assets after death? Would anyone be able to put the whole, you know, the whole will for a dog or a cat, which happens in other countries? Would that be possible for us here? Of course, the first thing that we would say, no, of course not. That is not possible. Do we say public policy in the, in the UAE? Yes, of course, public policy would be a reason for that. But again, there is a constitutional right for every human being that every a will should be written in the interest of humans, for instance. You, you're not supposed to be able, in general, to disinherit people, to be able to inherit animals, or maybe just put your whole assets on fire after um, you die. So maybe there were these questions that just popped out while we were looking at these points in and out. What do we say about a guardian? Every will can be written, and there is a guardian appointed in a will. Well, how does that happen in the UAE? So there was a lot of issues that we spoke about and we debated in that panel. Um, the, point, the most important thing that we had always to look at is to comply with the UAE law, to comply with the public policy of the country. And these points were very clear in, the, in terms of the executor appointment, the beneficiaries of the will, and the guardian. For instance, when we talked about the testator at that point, Part 3, Rule 9 of the rule states that the DFC wills will apply only to non-Muslim individuals over the age of majority. So that has excluded everybody who was not a Muslim. Who was a Muslim? I'm sorry, I just keep saying that Muslims about Muslims. So mainly these wills are exclusively for non-Muslims in this country. The testator should have should be a non-Muslim. Muslim testators must follow the Sharia law as implemented within the UAE law. The UAE law restricts the right of Muslim testators to bequeath more than a third, which is exactly what Cynthia has mentioned, and rightfully mentioned that. The third, the Sharia compliant will is only a will in third of the assets of the testator. And mainly it should not be for an inheritor. That is, of course, something that has been um, due to jurisprudence of Islam, had many opinions on it. And in the UAE, for instance, if um, a Muslim <coughs> dies and third of his money has been already given into a will can be given to an inheritor provided that the rest of the inheritors and every single one of them would agree to that. So mainly that is a Malikiya opinion that has been adopted by the UAE due to the following of the school of the Maliki. The UAE law restricts the allocations of the testator's estate among his her heirs. No will of a Muslim, even within the third, shall be registered with the DIFC. WPR, so which mainly takes away the Muslims completely, even in the third, which is mainly called a will. The executor can be subject to criminal liability under the UAE law. Uh, before that, we have to say that executor's age should be 21 years old at the time of the registration before the DIFC wills. When the, when the executor's na name is mentioned in the will, he will have to be at the age of 21 then, um, which is quite different from the UK, since so the executor's age must be over 18. Um, the executor in the UAE, uh, if probate has been granted to him, shall carry the consequences of his willful act even after his death. Um, that means any wrongdoing, mismanagement, or willful default under Rule 95 um, would be holding this, would be subjecting the executor there to the criminal liability. Of course, when we talk about criminal liability in the UAE, we're talking about different courts completely. 
This is where the actual interaction between the courts will appear. Um, so if the, court, if the courts of the DIFC find that the executor has acted in not in a good will, in a way that has been defaulting, been in any way fraudulent to the will, this person will be subject to the criminal laws of the UAE that are already implemented outside the DIFC. Um, of course, everybody knows here that the DIFC courts do not have um, either jurisdiction to criminal law. It's mainly uh, commercial, um, civil, and of course, now the, the registration of the wills. Regarding the Guardian, the Guardian has seriously caused a lot of uh, uh, debate, a lot of discussion. Because what is a guardian in the Western concept? A guardian is someone who you can leave your kids for to take care of. Under public order in this country, where Sharia is somehow a component of the public order, the guardianship has a completely different definition. Guardianship under the public order in this country can be wilayat nafs or wilayat mal, which means that the, the, there's a guardian of a person, of the person, and there's a guardian of <laughs> the money. Usually the guardianship of the money is only given to the, pair, the, the father's, I don't know how, how would you say, the parental from the father's side of the child. And the guardianship of the person would have to be always with, within a line of descent, um, which actually also gives, is, is mainly within the male relatives of the child from the father's side. That has caused really, uh, so, so how, do, how do I? Um, a, a person in the UAE who have no brothers, no cousins, no father, if in, in, this, in the event I die, what happens to my child? If I choose to give the guardianship to my closest friend, uh, closest cousin, who is not a male, but a female, you will have to understand that living in Dubai, within the UAE, applying the DIFC rules, would not take you out of the public order of the country. So we made sure that within the rules, we have complied with the overall laws that have supremacy here. So if we go by the rules, we go to rule 86 that states, at the state who has parental responsibility for a minor child who is habitually res resides with the testator in Dubai, may appoint in accordance with the applicable law of the child a guardian or guardians. So that is always, always left to the applicable law of the child as per the nationality of the child. But subject always to the law of the UAE. The example I gave when we were having these discussions at the, at the panel is imagine a fire breaks out in a building and the police barbs in and they find this young 14-year-old girl with her pajamas, and the guardian is in the house, his wife has traveled for work, and they look at this parent, who's not a parent, and this 14-year-old girl with a pajama on, and they would say, what is she doing with you in your house? That is not something anybody wants to be asked in this country. The point is that the government here is not keen on criminalizing people. It is just a way to protect the children. And this is, of course, the duty of the authorities here. You are not supposed to have children living with strangers, with people that are not related to them, especially when you have public order on top, which says that minors should not be girls especially living with anyone with a guardianship capacity except an uncle from the father's side or a grandfather and so on the descendants from that end. 
So this is where we had to, of course, look at the public law, public policy, the law of the UAE, and we will have to bear in mind that that is something always, as legal practitioners, should always watch out when we are writing these wills. This year, next year, the following year, and I hope that everybody just bears it in mind just to keep the will valid as much as possible. Rule 86 provides that the appointment of the guardian has to be in accordance with UAE law <coughs> order and the age of the guardian must be 21 at the time of the registration of the will before the DIFC wills and probate registry. As we said, <coughs> The testator's minor children must be habitually residing with the testator in Dubai. No residency requirements for the guardians, so they can be actually living outside the UAE as well. Um, a testator can appoint both interim and permanent guardians. The testator can appoint a guardian in accordance with the applicable law of the child but subject to the UAE law. And the testator cannot appoint more than two guardians at the same time. The interim and permanent guardians, as what Cynthia has mentioned, the interim can be, to a certain extent, something that we can um, do for the time being. Like, let's say the death of the parents has been like so shockingly um, um, out of, you know, it just happened, and the guardian that has been that they knew that they were available in Dubai to take care of their children in the event that they died dramatically in a car accident or something like that, not a long illness or whatsoever, can be there in that place to take care of them until, and they could be not relatives, they could be friends, neighbors, until this child is moved out of the country with the guardian that the UAE allows <laughs> or the guardian would move to Dubai to live with these children and take care of them. So this is, this is the way of us at the panel within these rules that we have actually explored and looked at and we found that that would be just so helpful for people to be able to um, face whatever comes of incidents, of, of, of accidents, of whatever could happen. So this is the interim and the permanent guardian. The, gu the guardian shall undertake to act as a guardian under the DIFC rules. Further, the guardian shall accept their appointment by witness statement at time of word registration. The guardians and the executors must again accept their appointments at the time of the probate. Uh, and after the death of the testator, the guardians will have parental responsibility towards the child. If, well, for whatever reason, at the time of probate, the guardian cannot accept their appointment, the courts may appoint a different guardian under the will in compliance with the applicable law. So that, again, would allow the court to interfere and act in its duty to safeguard the minor who is still in the UAE in, in these incidents. Um, now, if we talk again about what other courts would have jurisdiction while, um, uh, while the probate is, is, is under process, let's say in the event that a testator converts to Islam, a testator converts to Islam after having a will registered with the IFC, the testator's Interstate succession will be subject to the relevant court jurisdiction. The relevant court here will be the court outside the DIFC where this Muslim person will be subject to and will have his will completely invalidated and that the state will have then um, the UAE law to be subject to. So if it happens that the state converts to Islam, then the DIFC Will, will just be non-existent. The executor, then this is what we're talking about, that there could be other courts that would be involved in certain processes here. The executor may be held criminally liable, as we said, and that would also involve the UAE courts. Um, 
All movable and immovable property situated within the Emirate of Dubai can be disposed by the DRC will, which actually um, restricts the DRC will to the assets in Dubai. And I, I just love what Cynthia has come up with. <laughs> Amazingly, it is just a great idea. If you have any, if your clients, if you have any assets outside Dubai, yes. The, the, uh, the Jabal Ali Free Zone company would be the ideal solution. Because honestly, a lot of people are asking these questions now and they're saying, but we have a property in Abu Dhabi, we have a property, do we sell, do we? But that is a great idea. The Jabal Ali Free Zone is a Dubai asset that could be included in the DIFC win and the DIFC win could be applied to it. So maybe let's not put people off you know, buying in other UAE Emirates. There are great opportunities there and there are people who would be keen on the other Emirates, like in terms of investment or whatever. So that would be a great thing to advise clients and know that th there is this option. Um, as far as enforcement, as far as executing this will, um, we know for a fact that the DFC courts are currently communicating with the relevant authorities regarding uh, the issuing of grants of probate. Um, rule 19 states that the subsequent marriage, okay. This is um, something else. Now, what happens to the DIFC win if the testator divorces his wife or remarries? The subsequent marriage will invalidate the will such revocation will be ruled on by DRFC courts. Um, a subsequent divorce will invalidate the gift to the former spouse, and such revocation will be ruled on by DRFC courts following the divorce decision of the relevant court. Meaning the DRFC courts will have to look into um, uh, the divorce and say that the divorce is valid, and there, fr there, from there, the invalidation um, of the uh, gift to the former spouse uh, will be uh, decided on. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions, we'll be able to answer. Our last speaker for this session is Alistair Glover from uh, the firm of uh, Rag Lawrence Graham. Um, Alistair had developed a practice uh, in, in London uh, in his firm's private capital department uh, and part, much of that work was involved with advising high net worth individuals and families as well as family officers and trustees on global wealth holding and succession structures, tax and relocation. Um, because of his international client base, uh, Alistair has to have a strong working knowledge of onshore and offshore works, laws in multiple jurisdictions uh, and uses his practical experience to match the legal tools available to each client's unique circumstances in order to design and implement structures which achieve his client's objectives. Uh, he has private clients in the UK, UAE, Europe, at, uh, Asia, Africa, and North and South America. Doesn't leave much of the world uncovered, Alistair. So let's hear from you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, kind of introduction. So, Um, so today, um, in keeping with my sort of practice area, I'm uh, talking about potential threats and challenges to DIFC wills uh, with a focus on the international estate planning context. So I just want to sort of echo what's already been said before in respect of the wills and probate registry uh, rules. It's really a fantastic development for Dubai, and it's definitely one which is going to give individuals the potential to pass on their Dubai assets with uh, much greater certainty. And certainly, um, 
more security than we've ever had before. Uh, nevertheless, there are, in my view, uh, a number of factors which could undermine any planning undertaken in the DIFC. So the purpose of my talk is really to highlight some of these potential challenges and how they are or can be addressed uh, in the context of the DIFC rules. So as I see it, um, we've really got uh, potential challenges which fall into three broad categories. The first one is revocation, um, and by that I mean the accidental revocation of the DIFC will by a later foreign will. Uh, the next category is around the uh, formalities for the will itself and the, uh, the drafting and instruction process. And the third category, and probably the most important uh, for clients based here, is the uh, interaction of foreign law with the wills and probate rules themselves. So I'll be looking at how foreign law could give rise to challenges uh, and uh, in particular look at the EU uh, succession regulation which is very much on the horizon. So that first threat I mentioned is, is relatively straightforward and easily managed but it's, it's an extremely important one and that's accidental revocation of the DIFC will by a later foreign will. So rule 8 of our DIFC rules tells us how wills can be revoked and 1A tells us that a DIFC will can be revoked by a later will whether or not that later will complies with the DIFC rules. So that clearly leaves the door open to client executing DIFC will on day one, a couple of years down the line acquires a property let's say in France or makes a will in France. Uh, that later will doesn't take account of the DIFC assets and inadvertently could, could revoke the DIFC will. So it's all about careful planning and proper advice. It's probably also worth mentioning what the position is the other way around. Well, of course, we have our DIFC will, but it's limited to Dubai assets. So the risk of a DIFC revoking a will in another jurisdiction is, is limited in that it will only apply to the Dubai assets in that foreign will. So I've listed some of the other potential heads of challenge, and these are sort of traditional ones that we see in the, in the will writing uh, context. And uh, the form of the will itself has been, been touched on uh, by Cynthia. I'm not really going to talk about the international aspect of that. Here I'm talking about basic formalities for executing a valid will, such as how it's signed. Um, in terms of the DIFC, I don't really see that as much of an issue because we have the registration process. So the client has to attend the registry. They'll only register the will if it complies with certain minimum mandatory criteria. So I think we're very unlikely to see claims emanating uh, on the basis of the, the, the will has not been validly executed. Um, the content of the will itself, um, well, the registration process doesn't really deal with that. And here I'm thinking about sloppy drafting. So again, the WH Smith will that Cynthia mentioned clearly uh, introduces sort of the prospect of a badly drafted will which won't actually give effect to the testator's wishes. So that's something to be wary of, and again, proper legal advice is required in the content. And, and what about the capacity of the testator? So, do they understand what they're doing, what assets they've got, uh, who they might give them to in effect of actually making a will in the DIFC. Um, somewhat interestingly, when I was reviewing the rules, I assumed this would be a mandatory requirement that they're of sound mind, essentially. But actually, it, it's not a, one of the mandatory requirements in the rules. However, it, it is still very much uh, a requirement, um, otherwise we could face a challenge. And it is implied by Rule 10.5, which tells us that the registry isn't under any duty to check on capacity, but they, if they have sort of suspicions, then they can insist on a, a suitable report before they will actually register a will. So again, I think that registration requirement is still a potential safeguard, and, it, and as well, if proper legal advice is taken, it's part of the lawyer's job to be checking um, the capacity of the testator um, as part of that process. So again, probably unlikely to see many challenges on that front. 
And the last one on this slide is, is forgery. And again, I think the registration and one of the reasons this is such a great innovation and something that I think would be great in the UK, we see too many forged wills and issues arising um, uh, on, on this basis, is that the registration requirement should um, essentially nullify any risk of, of forgery. The client has to turn up to the appointment, identify themselves um, to the registrar. So it's, it's almost a negligible risk in my view. So what about other areas of challenge? So the third category I mentioned. So that challenge is based on uh, an applicable foreign law. So is there anything in the DIC rules that prevents uh, foreign law being relevant in, in terms of challenges to DIC rules? Well, no, there's not. And in fact, we're told at uh, Rule 111 that an individual can make an application to enforce rights under a foreign law. It tells us the basic requirements, documentary requirements for making such a claim and how such a claim should be brought, which is under Part 55 of the RDC, which Ella's going to speak about in a bit. So we know that a, cl a claim based on foreign law can be made. But in what sort of circumstances might this actually arise? In the DRC, we have testamentary freedom, or there are no limits placed on testamentary freedom in the DRC rules. And this slide um, shows a map of the world, um, quite clearly. Uh, we want to focus on the blue, the dark blue, and the, the red uh, countries. So the dark blue are, are non forced airship regimes where generally um, the testator will have freedom to deal with their estates they see fit, and the red countries are forced airship jurisdictions. So you can see that most, uh, most of Europe is actually uh, under some sort of forced airship regime. So how specifically might this forced airship be relevant? Well, let's look at an example. Suppose we have a testator who has, makes a DIFC will, they leave their Dubai estate to their surviving spouse, absolutely, and they choose to exclude their children for whatever reason. Uh, the Dubai estate comprises uh, real estate, company shares, and cash. So bearing those sort of facts in mind, let's uh, compare the position as it applies under English and French law. Now, both countries have essentially the same private international laws in terms of succession. And uh, they both state that the law of domicile governs succession to movable property. So that is the cash and the shares in my example. Whereas the situs of the property, the location of the property, uh, the, the relevant jurisdictions law will govern succession to that property. So what sort of impact does this have on our DIFC plan? Well, for an English domiciled individual, there's no impact at all. He has testamentary freedom under the DIFC rules. He has testamentary freedom under the laws of England and Wales, and his will should be fully enforceable. Uh, for our French testator, uh, the position could be slightly different um, because of the forced airship regime. So in respect of the real estate that is subject to the law of the location in which it's, it's situated, one would hope that the DIFC rules of testamentary freedom would apply, but his, in, his movable property, his cash and shares, are definitely uh, open to challenge on the basis that he hasn't dealt with them in accordance with the provisions of French law. That's the position as things stand today. However, we have on the horizon a sweeping piece of legislation that's going to change the landscape of succession significantly. Um, and it's relevant outside the EU just as much as it is inside the EU. Um, and that's the EU succession regulation. It's also known as Brussels IV. Um, what's the purpose of this regulation? Well, this is a well-intentioned EU idea which is designed to harmonize succession across EU member states. Um, all of the member states have adopted this regulation except for the UK, Ireland and Denmark. 
um, and the regulation will is in force, but it will only actually apply to debts uh, occurring after 16th of August this year. Um, so what are the, the key points of this regulation? What's it actually going to, to change? Well, it's going to allow individuals to uh, elect for the law of their nationality, and if they have multiple nationalities, they can choose which one they want to elect, and that will apply to the succession to the, of their entire estate, as far as the regulation is concerned. If they don't make such an election, the default position is that if the law of the state in which they die habitually resident will apply to the uh, devolution of the entire estate. So it's quite complicated, but how does this actually affect the outcomes in the, in the example I gave earlier? Well, for our English domicile test data, there's no change. Again, uh, the regulation doesn't apply in the UK. Um, so he can deal with his device state as he wishes. For the French test data, the position is potentially very different. If he's made a will in France electing the French law to apply, then it potentially opens the DRC will up to challenge in respect of all of his property. So that would be his immovable and immovable property. Uh, conversely, if there was no election in the DRC will and he died habitually resident in Dubai, it's certainly possible that his entire estate could be opened up to the concept of testamentary freedom under the regulation. So it's potentially a, a planning opportunity for clients, but it's very much a, a client by client um, analysis. There is a, a sting in the tail of the, the regulation and something that everyone should be aware of, and that's the, the need to review existing arrangements in the light of the EU succession regulation. Uh, Article 83.4 uh, is essentially a deemed choice of law provision. So if a client has made a will already in their home jurisdiction, the law of their nationality, they haven't made an election, but it's made under the relevant law, then they're deemed to have chosen that law to apply to the to succession of their entire estate. Um, and if clients aren't aware of it, it could obviously have significant unintended consequences. It's definitely a question we need to be asking when we're drafting DIFC wills to ensure that either the, the testator is happy with the risk of challenge or we plan around it. So the, the final point I want to make in the international context is, is really around tax. And we have no inheritance tax in the UAE, which is fantastic, but under the laws of most jurisdictions, uh, there will be some form of inheritance or, or death tax. Uh, in the case of the UK, for example, we have 40% liability on the worldwide assets of a UK domiciliary. Um, and it's the liability of the UK executors to pay that tax before they can actually obtain a grant of probate and deal with the UK estate. So it's really a practical point that we need to take into account and be aware of when we're drafting our DOMC will. So what should we do? In my view, you should have either the same executors in your UK will as you do in your DOFC will, so that they're aware of the liabilities that are going on, uh, and the worldwide estate can be effectively administered, or you have at least some overlap between the executors. So in summary, I'd say you know, the DIFC rules, fantastic innovation. We're working with them. We've been given the tools to give clients um, the certainty in passing their Dubai assets as they, they wish. Nevertheless, the key message for me is that you can't look at the DIFC will in isolation. You must consider the international context and the relevance of any other foreign law. Otherwise, it may end up uh, undermining what you're, what you're seeking to achieve within the DIFC. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, I would like to have your attention for five more minutes. I know we've had a pretty lengthy session, so and we do want to keep a couple of minutes as well for questions and answers. However, I wanted to refer um, a couple of notes to part 55. 
of the roles, which I deem will be important um, in the maybe not so far future. Now, when I talk about these last um, slides here, part 55, two premises. First of all, I hope that all our testators will live happy and long lives, whether in the UAE or abroad, and that they will not pass away very fast, so we don't need to deal with, um, with probate uh, too soon. And second, a, a premise that I'm making is that um, in line with um, figures that we have from other jurisdictions around the world, when someone makes a will for their hard-earned assets, um, in 99% of the cases, the beneficiaries and the people that they leave behind, their loved ones, would not um, contest the will. They will not object to the wishes of the deceased. So in 99% of the cases, we would assume that uh, probate claims um, are non-contentious, meaning that uh, the appointed executor or beneficiary would come in, request for a grant of probate or grant of administration. The judge would then confirm the validity of the will, and then the will will be executed and the estate administered in accordance to their wishes, as stated in the will. Now, in the 0.1% of the cases, we do have people um, creating contentious probate claims, meaning um, parties claiming against the will. Uh, what are these sort of claims? They can be um, claims based on numerous uh, situations, to which I will refer to later on. Um, for the purpose of our roles, they are split into two. Um, the first claim that could be made against the will is to prevent the issuance of a grant. So that would be immediately after someone has passed away, before a grant has been even issued by the BFC courts. Um, and the second type would be to revoke an existing grant. So if the courts has issued a grant of probate to the executor, allowing them to start the um, distribution of the assets and the administration of the estate of the deceased, to then put a hold on it um, due to various reasons. In any event, the executor becomes the party to the claim as they are the administrator of the estate. So they are basically the party that should defend the will. Um, in the practical matters, Rule 55.3 explains how to start a probate claim, and Rule 55.4 um, gives rise to a question um, that Alistair was um, referring to early on. Has the person drafted a will, um, a subsequent will, that might actually um, have an implication on the DFC will? It used to be the case that people would draft one last and final will. They would have all their estates situated in one jurisdiction. Nowadays, people uh, buy property. They have businesses in various countries around the world. And they, the new tendency is to draft multiple wills from multiple jurisdictions, ensuring that those wills are enforceable through the various local courts. Therefore, um, it is important for a person to actually know that they have the freedom to change their mind at any time throughout their life. Ideally, from our perspective, from the rules perspective, is that we would love to actually see people come in and modify their already registered will with the DIFC. But as you might be aware, a lot of people actually decide to um, leave the Dubai at some point and um, spend their last years possibly in other countries and would forget about updating their um, and modifying their DIFC will. In any event, the court is under the duty to actually consider any subsequently drafted will, which might, which we call a testamentary document, which might have effect on the validity of the DIFC will of the deceased. So if any party, not only the executor, if any party knows about the existence of a subsequent will that actually has an impact on this DIFC will, where the testator would have expressed um, wishes that are contrary to the DIFC will, then they have to present it to the DIFC courts. Further on, the rules talk about counterclaims, and a very important point for you to note is that um, once a process has started through the courts, um, the courts will serve the claimant and defendant. Now, once someone has been served, the failure to acknowledge the service does not bring about a default judgment as it would in other jurisdictions. The claimant still may proceed with the claim as if the defendant has acknowledged service. For the legal professionals amongst you, this is an important point to note. 
And the second important point also, that only the courts can discontinue or dismiss a claim. Part 55 also continues and talks about claims for rectification of wills. Um, that is to be read in conjunction with the WPR rules, Part 5. That means, at some point, um, the intentions of the testator might have not been clearly laid out, or a party would think that there is a need to rectify a specific provision stated in the will, and so they can launch a claim for rectification of the will. So they don't want to invalidate the will, they won't, don't want to challenge what has been stated in the will, and um, they just need to basically seek a clarification. Part 3, Rule 5519, talks about claims um, that are aimed to um, effect the substitution or the removal of executors. Some people decide to um, appoint joint executors. They would not trust one person to deal with the entire administration of the estate. Um, there are many instances where one of the joint executors just cannot um, attend to their appointment, cannot uh, prove the grant, accept the grant of probate. Um, in such instances, or of administration issues, so one of the executors or the beneficiaries would not be happy the way the, uh, with the way the uh, estate is administered. Therefore, um, they can launch a claim and they can actually have the court look at whether a specific executor should be substituted or removed from their appointment. Part B is equally important. Um, I was mentioning that at the onset, the claims can be made in terms of administering the estate. So the courts can determine questions arising to the administration, such as um, the parties would seek the court to um, give them an order um, as to how to administer the estate. So there will be a time when either the executor or other beneficiaries are not clear um, as to what the will's intentions are and how to administer the estate in such a way to give effect to the wills of the, um, the, the will of the testator, and they can always come and seek for the, um, um, the direction of the court. Uh, creditors of an estate, so if the estate has specific debts that haven't been satisfied yet, can come and claim against the estate and seek to redress and to receive their um, owed um, share of the estate. Um, general claims against the estate, parties that might have beneficial interests, persons that are entitled under a will, and then, um, as has been mentioned beforehand, the enforcement of rights under a foreign law, which is specifically um, guided through Rule 111 of the Wills and Probate Registry. Now, all of these claims basically try to set out a, a system of equilibrium where people who have certain claims against the state or who have been somehow impacted by the will, would get access to justice and they would have their fair chance to um, state their case before the judge. We, as we know, people do things with the best of the intentions. However, certain circumstances might have changed in the state of a person from the time they drafted the will and when the time they have passed away. Families might have changed completely in their circumstances, their assets, and so forth. And so they should be given the right under a fair and equitable justice system to be heard. Part 55 deals specifically with the processes um, that guide the uh, claim processes in the DIFC courts. Thank you very much for your um, time today and for listening in carefully to all of us. I hope that if there is one thing that you came out of this um, lecture with is that um, it is a simple and a complex matter at the same time. It requires careful consideration. We know that succession planning is something that people do not like to talk about. Many professionals would advise their clients to draft wills but wouldn't have a will themselves. Many um, people would actually postpone drafting a will um, thinking that the inevitable would not arise tomorrow. Um, but it is important to think about it and to benefit from the newly established system um, that is here in the DIFC. I would like to give the floor now to questions and we, would, uh, we will try to uh, respond to all your questions um, as they arise. I think we will have another 15, 10 to 15 minutes for this. Thank you. We have, I can see a few hands up there. Let's take the lady in the second row. My question is, how 
to impart a person as a non-Muslim or Muslim in practice? Hello? Uh, that is a very interesting question indeed, and that this is something that will have to be determined by the judges. Um, obviously, the uh, determination from the, for the purpose of our roles is that we have to rely on the declaration of religion by the testator at time of drafting the will and at time of registration. So part of the minimum requirements of our will, you will see them on its form number one on page 66 of the rules, of the wills and probate registry rules, is that the testator has to declare that they are not a Muslim nor have they ever been a Muslim. Okay? We can also look at a registry, and as, we, as every testator has to identify themselves, obviously um, passports of uh, um, people with, uh, coming from um, majoritarily Muslim countries would identify the religion of the person on the, um, uh, on the um, um, identity card or the passport as it has implications for their legal rights and duties. Um, but for most people, the religion would not be um, clearly identified, so we have to rely on the declaration of the person. We do not wish to discriminate upon, um, based on names only, as we know that Muslim-sounding names um, are very um, often um, occurrences in, in, for example, Latin America. Um, and then obviously, at time of probate, um, there are two scenarios, sorry, three scenarios. One is that the person was not a Muslim, probate would uh, occur through the DIFC courts as we have the jurisdiction over it. Second scenario is that the person has made a fraudulent declaration at time of oil registration. They were in fact a Muslim. And a family member or a party knowing about their religion would come forth and would bring evidence before the court to assert that the person was indeed Muslim. The same um, evidence would then be uh, taken into consideration, the same sort of standard as applicable by um, the, DI, the Dubai courts right now. Um, I think in Dubai right now, uh, mainland Dubai it is that you have to either bring two witnesses to attest of uh, their religion, or to bring in a conversion certificate that has been duly uh, certified and, and um, proven <laughs> to be an authentic document. And so um, the third scenario would be that the testator was not a Muslim of time of registration but has converted later on, in which case the same would apply as now the proof of their religion would have to be for brought forward and the judge will have to make a decision. If indeed it was found that the testator, either at time of will registration or later on, has become a Muslim, then we stay our case as we do not have jurisdiction uh, over Muslims' um, uh, succession matters. Good evening. My name is Vijay Daniel. You see, there was an article about a few weeks back in the newspaper. When the DIFC, the article came in the newspaper, along with that, there was a remark from Dr. Ali Rahim, who is the head of the Association of Court, stating that legislation is on the process in final drafting stages, when the, it will be ready by the end of the year, wherein the law will be there uh, with Dubai courts, will set up uh, uh, will procedure for, in Arabic language for registration of wills for non-Muslims, and it will be similar to DFC, and it will be com, uh, for the probate registry, and uh, it will also complement the two. So, what does it mean? It's really confusing that we have a DFC rule for non-Muslims, and now we will also have something coming up in DFC uh, Dubai courts to also uh, cater to the non-Muslims, and both are going to complement each other. So what is the need of it if DFC is a foolproof thing? While she's going up there, the short answer is when you pay your money and you make your choice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, one is for Arab speakers and the other is for English speakers. Okay. So does it mean that the one uh, the Dubai courts, it will not accept English? Uh, is correct indeed. So it's all about choice. As the Chief Justice has said, there is a Arab-speaking non-Muslim minority living in this country, and the idea is to offer choice to people so that investors feel that they have the comfort to invest here, uh, knowing and having the security and peace of mind as to what happens with their inheritance. <coughs> and so the Dubai courts were pleased to hear that the Dubai courts obviously are following on to the same um, uh, ground as well. Good evening, Charles Cuthbert from Everest Legal Consultancy. How will you determine whether a death in service benefit is likely to be uncovered under a DIFC will, a death in service benefit? Hi. Um, so 
sorry, I didn't catch your name, but nevertheless, uh, EOSB, death and service, or end of service benefits that occur at the time of death, is absolutely an asset of the deceased. So therefore, it's to be distributed in accordance with the relevant um, testamentary document if he has made, or he or she has made a will. And if not, it will be as per the policy of the company. Some companies have actually allowed, including Dubai government companies, have allowed non-Muslims to opt and nominate beneficiaries to take advantage or to take the benefit of their EOSB at the time of death. Uh, and some of them have decided to adhere to Sharia. So if you remember the Article 17.1, it could be said that some of those uh, insightful uh, organizations are using Article 17.1 to allow the testator to opt for the country's law, his own country's law, in order to distribute his end of service benefit. Hi, I'm um, Jerry Rogers. Um, the mutual recognition and enforcement of um, the IFC judgments and the by Court's judgments has been a major success story since 2012. What we've seen is mainly the commercial uh, judgments that have been enforced. Has there been any discussion or guidance with um, the by Courts regarding the enforcement of um, the judgments in relation to probate, for example, with real estate in Dubai? Um, yes, there has been discussion, and the discussion is still ongoing. And uh, obviously, there are um, we have the enforcement guide at uh, the uh, DIFC courts and the law of 16 of 2011, which guides the enforcement of uh, DIFC court judgments. DIFC courts have uh, jurisdiction over civil and commercial matters, and now the jurisdiction has been extended to probate, and the same process would apply as per the enforcement guide currently in place. Hi, I'm Saki from Kalidari. Um, in terms of enforcement, for example, um, if a client is based in France and is based in contesting probate, um, would it be advisable to get a judgment in France and then get it enforced in the Dubai courts? Or would the, the judge um, apply the French law, which would then supersede the, the, the IFC law, which is based on English law? Does that make sense? Um, well, yeah, under the English um, law. Under um, Rule 111, it basically tells you what documents you need to bring a claim based on um, an applicable foreign law. And in the list of documents, the outset you see the grants for probate or another court order, essentially. So you would go to France, get your grant, come to the DIFC with that, uh, together with the opinion of a suitably qualified lawyer, I think it's an affidavit that's required. Um, and any other documentary evidence you have to support the claim. Um, and my second question is, if an executor has come to court and you take criminal proceedings, can you bring a simultaneous civil proceedings for compensation? And would that be in the DIA <coughs> courts or would that be under the UAE civil court? So can you have two? Well, is you want to be able to get compensation for the criminal case? The executor would be if, as if he has committed fraud and you would bring a criminal proceedings, but in terms of compensation um, for the beneficiaries, would they bring a civil claim in the DIFC courts or would it be in the UAE courts? Or can you choose? Well, we have no criminal jurisdiction, so certainly yeah, that, would be criminal. that part would be in taken care of, of by Dubai courts. Uh, whether we have jurisdiction over the executive will depend, uh, subject to what Heather is going to say, but. Under the general law, it depends on you know, Article 5 uh, of the course law, which sets out our jurisdiction. Uh, and in this context, it's not a contractual matter, I don't think. So it would be determined by whether or not uh, the fraud was committed within the DIFC. Right? So if he's managing the estate out of the DIFC, uh, or to some extent, there was some the wrongful act, if you like, uh, was actually channeled through the DIFC. I mean, fraud can be legal, involves some kind of transfer to a bank. If it went through the bank uh, in the DIFC, then we do have jurisdiction. Complement quickly. 
The rules are very clear um, with regards to the duties, obligations, and rights of the executor. So if the executor would actually fail to comply with their duties, rights, and obligations, and a party would launch a claim against the executor for uh, the administration, so the wrongful administration of the estate under Part 55, obviously the IFC courts will have jurisdiction. And again, the will is, is basically um, placed under the exclusive jurisdiction of the IFC courts. And any probate matter arising and any claim would come under the IFC courts. At the end of this year, when the Dubai law will be finalized, it would reconfirm the same, that the Dubai courts will not touch the IFC registered wills. So probate matters for wills that have been registered in the DIFC will be handled through the DIFC courts, and probate matters for um, Dubai wills and, and Arabic-speaking wills will be then handled through Dubai courts. Thank you. Hello, Angela Monkovic from Nexus Insurance Brokers. I've uh, just got three quick questions. The first one's probably quite obvious. Um, if people are assets in these are Emirates, then is the jurisdiction of the courts applicable there? For example, if it's Ajman or Fujira, because I'm assuming it's all Dubai related properties that can play on Absolutely, only Dubai. Only Dubai. Yeah, unless, of course, you use the Jabla Lucrezia and Offshore's property. Yeah. The second one was um, to do with using the common law trusts idea of common law rules for the IFC. A lot of the rule of the is trusts involved. How, how does that will, will cope with the situation with the existing wills in place that have got trusts in the actual will themselves? What rules are in place at the moment today? And finally, the question I've got is a practical question. If there's been plans of written wills already to date, home wills. Sorry? Home wills made in the same in the UK. There are many existing wills already, plans. Yes. Do they have to rewrite the wills or do they yes. have to think about if they've got no assets in the UE at all? They just say, my couple with no children at all, but they have an existing UK will. Would they have to write a new will to be compliant or would that be sufficiently? They adequate? wouldn't want to do that because they don't have to buy assets. So. Why would they pay 15,000 euros for the world? Well, that's my question. <laughs> but the second question, Alistair, do you want to ask that question? Sure. The, uh, the trust side, well, I think the answer is, you know, we have trust law here in the DIFC, um, and trust, and the default of any election in the world will actually be um, governed by DIFC trust law. Um, and it's a very relevant question, because almost every will in the common law standard creates a trust. So even if it's a simple trust, um, that is a very good question. But I think the answer is DIFC trust law applies. Um, I would like to add on to that. We have to distinguish between inter vivos trusts and testamentary trusts. So through the DIFC will, people can make testamentary trusts. If they happen to have a trust beforehand, then it is a time of probate that the executor will have to identify which assets have been already given away to their inter vivos trust and what is it that they still own at time of death and that can be then bequeathed on to their uh, beneficiaries. Hello, I think this is, sorry, I think this is for Cynthia. Um, you mentioned um, mortgaged or unmortgaged property um, could be left. In a situation where it's a spouse with the property title in his own name, um, and then he wants to leave the property to his wife on his demise. Two questions. One, would there be, uh, you may not know the answer, would there be a transfer fee, um, 4%? Um, and also, would there be a problem with the mortgage going to the spouse? Okay, well, I can use my existing um, experience from uh, dealing with DLD and banks arising from Dubai inheritance um, subject to these home wills or using Sharia. Uh, I usually ask my uh, clients, uh, the executors or beneficiaries of the Sharia heirs of an estate to actually comply with Sharia because it's a much faster route. But we will all arrive at the same point, whether you have a Sharia succession order, a Dubai civil court of appeal order, or a DIFC order. You will all face the same government body. You will face the same DLD, the RTA, the banks, and so on and so forth. DLD is, of course, very, very uh, industrious in charging fees, and they would uh, charge 
from the transfer of the deceased to the Sharia heirs, or in this case, the beneficiaries under a DIFC will, only as a gift fee, which is at present 0.125%. So that is fantastic. Uh, providing it's blood relative, sorry. It has to be blood relative, immediate blood relative. It will even go as far as cousins, uncles, and so on. But, but, but spouse. Spouse definitely, spouse definitely covered. So on the second point, sorry, I'm getting old. What was your second question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the mortgage, very easy. Um, they, they always have life insurance policy, especially for non-Muslims. So the life insurance policy will pay off upon, upon death the, the amount of the mortgage. The executors will make sure that they notify the insurance company, get the NOC from the mortgaging bank, and then you go back to the DLD to get that discharge. Voila. Thank you. Stephen Counts. <coughs> um, there was a slide that showed... It's not a nan in the back. <laughs> there's a slide that showed that if you had a, a JASA company, you could put um, assets and other emirates into this company and would be covered by the will. So does that mean that you could include your worldwide assets under a JASA company and have the same benefit? Could do. Could do. In fact, some people are very tickled by it because uh, they, as like most of us, are nomads. We have jumped from one especially high tax country, fortunately for me I come from Hong Kong, which is low tax, and to the UAE, and let's say they've been here for decades, and they do not want to be UK domicile, let's say. So this is a perfect time to put their offshore assets under Jabal Ali Free Zone Offshore, provided, of course, those jurisdictions allow you to do that. Sometimes there could be horrendous stamp duty and costs involved. I've ex explored, for example, uh, looking at a client's Spanish estate. It was more expensive to transfer into an offshore company than to pay inheritance tax. So you have to look at each jurisdiction separately. Uh, my name is Adnan Rahim. I have two questions. Um, the first one uh, to attorney Diane, to Diana, is if a Muslim resident or a UA citizen in his will, the one third, creates or requests or bequests a trust under the NFC, <coughs> would the mainland courts recognize that? With the one third. Well, I don't oh. see any reason that they would dismiss that. And then the my. Yeah, the trust is the trust, as explained by Anna, has a certain um, rules regulating it in in the DIFC WPR. So the trust would not automatically become the same trust under the will of. You can't really take it as sure. far as to become a will in the IFC. No, it's, it's the testator in his will, Muslim testator in yes. his will. But in a third, yes. Okay, simply says, I bequeath my, or I, I you wish to have a trust under the DIFC for one third of my estate. And he does. Then if, you say, then if you say this is fine, then that raises a second question. If under the DIC will recognize that, knowing that what the first thing Cynthia meant, this is for non-Muslims. This is not a DIFC will, you it's see. It's a Sharia will. Sharia will, but if, 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 if there is a valid bequest under mainland UAE that, that recognizes a, a trust for the one-third, which is Sharia compliant and legally compliant, why would not DIFC recognize that? DIFC courts would recognize a trust created under the rules of DIFC, and DIFC trust can be created by any religion. It doesn't have to be non-Muslims. So the weight of the DIFC would only be limited to the non-Muslims. So Just the wills. Yeah, exactly. wills. Okay, so you would rec so the DIFC courts would recognize the a trust, trust created by Muslims within the one third or so yeah. it's recognized by the mainland courts. Yeah. Okay, they, uh, fine. I, it hasn't been tested. I haven't seen it actually from experience that the trust was actually <coughs> set up, initiated. It's bound to happen. It, it, it should happen, but you know how many 
convincing people of no and giving us some trust so far. So this is the problem that we still have. It's bound to happen because we, uh, I mean, I know as, as, as when we tested, trust we are not say, uh, yeah. institutionalized in mainland UAE, unfortunately. Yeah, but the point is, why wouldn't a judge in Dubai courts accept the trust under the third? Would that be acceptable? Would that be done? We don't know. It hasn't been tested, but if it is ever done, there, there's no Sharia reasons why he should not accept it. Yeah, well, the Sharia supports that. Exactly. So the, the, the second question is again for you: Is under mainland courts, if um, a testator in his will uh, decides to select one of the numerous Sharia schools of thoughts? Yes. You know, either he wants Malik or Ahmed or Hanfak. Would the courts recognize that? No. Just no. Malik. It goes by Malik, and in certain cases, we've seen <coughs> that the courts are quite lenient towards Ibn Taymiyyah lately. Uh, I don't know, I've seen the family law, that they would want to go with the, with, with the fatwa that is practical, that is very much pro-social. Um, if you want to get out of the Maliki school and you want to leave it up to the fatwa, they want something that would be very useful, practical. That's how they define it, let's say. Of course, you're limiting your opinion to wills. Okay, or in your no, no, I'm talking in general in family law. I mean, I'm talking about even uh, divorce, custody. This is what we have seen lately as a trend. Yeah, but that does not apply to commercial transactions, let's say Islamic banking. We're still very mad at that. Okay, thank you very much. I think you get a little bit confused about the interaction between a home will and a DIT will. So if one already has a home English will, um, which at the moment I think is probably says it covers one's worldwide assets, but presumably you can redraft that. You can say this will apply to my assets outside the UAE. Is it possible for someone to do that? Um, and if you do that and re-sign your home will and then set up your DIFC will to deal with your assets here, and you die, will both will, will the wills will be enforced separately? Correct. Is that right? Yes. But in the case of an English will, your worldwide estate could fall to be assessed for has inheritance been, has tax. It has to be. Has to be. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're UK domicile. Right. But if you're non-dom and only resident UK with UK assets with a UK will or English will, then you don't have to declare under yeah. your grant of probate. Yes. That is why a lot of people who are coming out of UK domicile yes. or non-dom yeah. are very interested in the IFC wills. Yeah. But. Sorry, just to don't think that's a little bit further. Uh, if you, I mean, I, I probably do have quite a, a strong case for being considered from Afghanistan. I'm a fifth generation board of law and never a so But um, if I was therefore non domiciled but I did have assets back in the UK, mm -hmm. would they then be treated according to the DIFC rules? No, because your assets in the UK, number one, <coughs> does that mean that you haven't severed your ties with the UK and therefore would still be arguably UK DOM, number one. Number two, have you done a separate UK will, therefore English will, for your UK assets? I assume it's a property, therefore it's required. No, it's not. That if it's not a property, get that asset out of the UK. Okay, <laughs> Anyway. Separate advice. Thank you for all your attention today. Thank you to the distinguished guests for uh, their time and their expertise and their energy today. Um, I wish you a safe return home. Thank you. Bye bye.